Welcome to Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Weldon. Today's episode is the next installment of the brilliant Firefly, Revolt, the final book in our original trilogy by Daniel Hines. If you haven't already, listen back to books one and two of Firefly to get caught up. Thanks! Enjoy the episode! The Brilliant Firefly, Revolt Chapter 9, Behind the Masks You just couldn't stay away, could you, old man? Jill felt as though she were at the bottom of the well, the world a fuzzy circle of light lost in the heavens. She was sitting in some kind of chair, and people were talking. Dad? Dad, is that you? Was that her mother's voice? Why is she calling me dad? Jill thought. Sorry about that gas, Jack. It's highly effective, but the wake-up can be a little disorienting. I synthesized it from a rare African spider, engineering it to bypass all the normal air filters. Once again, biology trumps technology. The gas. It all came back to her in a rush. Of course her mother confused who she was. She was still in the firefly armor. Whoever had taken her prisoner had made a big mistake. Come now, Jack. I know you're awake in there. Firefly! Jill roared, leaping to her feet. At least that's what she tried to do. When she attempted to move, though, the suit was sluggish around her, like she was buried in motor oil. She yelled but only managed to rise a few inches before slumping back into her chair. A laugh rang out, gleeful and cruel. Jill looked up. There, on his throne, was the Scarlet King. He was covered all over in scarlet armor. On TV, it had looked metal, but up close, Jill saw it for what it was. A kind of carapace, an organic shell like the plating on a particularly nasty insect. Pale human eyes peered out through the mask, and the crown was obsidian, glittering black as pitch. You think I'd leave you in working armor? He said. You're bathed in an EMP field of my own design. No one has been able to replicate your anomalous thrust energy, but I have found a way to negate it. There, in that chair, you may as well be a child, playing in cardboard armor. Jill looked around as best she could. She was sitting on a wide chair in front of the throne. Beneath her, a large panel of the floor glowed a gentle violet, generating, Jill assumed, the EMP field. She tried to speak but couldn't. The suit was dead. Her jaw was locked in place. What do you want from us, you monster? Jill turned her head to look at the voice. No easy feat in the dead suit. It was her mom. She looked healthy, maybe a few pounds thinner, dark around the eyes, but relatively unharmed. Her hands were handcuffed behind her back, but otherwise, like Jill, she was just sitting in a chair. Trust mom to insult the supervillain holding her hostage. Despite everything else, Jill found she was kind of proud. Surprisingly, the Scarlet King seemed to enjoy it as well. Anne, Anne, my dear Anne, he said, rising from the throne. I tried to leave you alone. I tried to let you live your life, separate from all the nastiness between myself and Jack, but you had to move to the farm. You had to get in the way. You should have stayed out of it, Anne. I may be a villain, but I never wanted to be a bad parent. What is he talking about? thought Jill. What are you talking about? asked Anne. The Scarlet King laughed again. It was almost a giggle, really. Who are you? I suppose you deserve to know. I suppose you deserve to see what's behind the mask, he said. There was a long slow hiss, and the front of his scarlet mask slid forward. He reached up, taking it in both hands. After all, he said, we're all family here. He pulled the mask away. Jill's jaw dropped. Could it really be? The Scarlet King shook out his long silver hair. Wait, her long silver hair. The Scarlet King was a woman. She looked older, she looked strong, she looked just like Jill's mom. Anne saw it, too. 
she stammered, eyes wide. Are you my mother? The Scarlet King smiled. She set her mask aside and removed her helmet as well, though Jill noted she took the crown and settled it on her silver hair. Yes, Anne, she said, sad even through her smile. Yes, you're mine. Jill watched her mom's face shift from confused to sad to angry and back again. Jill could read it well, because the same emotions were warring inside her, too. What? How? The Scarlet King settled back on her throne. The room was quiet for a long moment. Jill wanted desperately to scream, to say that she wasn't her Grandpa Jack, but the suit was just dead weight. How? said the Scarlet King, as if asking herself. How? A simple question to ask, but a harder one to answer. I suppose it started in grad school, in my bio lab. I was smart. Too smart, really. And when the professors got wind of what I was working on, they had me expelled. The cowards. I saw early on there was no funding for a female genius, not back then. So I went rogue. I found groups that didn't care if you were male or female or even human, as long as your science was wild, powerful, visceral. As long as your science was mad science, they had a place for you. They even had a place for the wild doctor Scarlet King. That's my real name, you know. Scarlet King. It says so on my birth certificate and everything. I never meant to hide. I never meant for the world to think I was a man. But they were so ignorant, so obtuse. When Scarlet King, glorious in battle armor and leading a herd of dinosaurs when she took over the White House and held the country hostage, did they even connect her to the mousy genius blacklisted by labs over the country? Of course they didn't. Even then, with the proof before them, they wouldn't believe a woman had crushed them with their own precious science. Even with my name on their lips, they denied me. For a moment, she dropped to a whisper. They all denied me. Even him. Even my Jack. It was early in my criminal career. I had just gotten started. I wasn't regarded as evil back then, simply misguided. Of course, I was the only sane person in a wild world, but that's besides the point. It was on a little tropical island covered with jungle, one of my early bases. It was too hot and humid, creeping vines all over. A terrible design, but I was inexperienced. Jack, Firefly, he flew in and shut down my Lotus engine, but his suit was damaged in the fight. Unfortunately, so was my helicopter. Firefly signaled for a rescue, but it was going to take three days. Three days alone on a beautiful island of my own design. Three days bobbing gently, a giant cork in the warm waters of the Pacific. Three days, and we fell in love. It couldn't last, of course. I had bigger plans, bigger ambitions. Science so bold the world called it criminal. Jack, he didn't understand. He was like all the rest. He had his precious technology, all his toys, but he warned me against manipulating biology. He said I'd get hurt. He said I'd hurt others. He said it was too dangerous to play God. I called him a coward. He called me a fool. I left, but I was already pregnant. I tried to raise you, but it only lasted six months. It was difficult, of course. Have you ever tried hacking genomes while feeding a baby? Have you ever tried designing an army of walking Venus flytraps with a little one on your hip? It was quite a sight, I'll tell you, but I wouldn't stop trying. My work was important to me, but you were the most important, and I wanted to have it all. But by that point, I was gaining notoriety. There were nights spent on the run, nights in ruinous factories and nights in subterranean bases deep below the cold earth, nights hiding in a drainage ditch from some flying hero, and nights battling black market merchants when deals went sideways. 
It was no life for a child, for my child. So I sent you to live with Jack. Jack was the only one who knew I was a woman, and he never told. I went on calling myself Scarlet King, THE Scarlet King, daring them to figure out my secret, daring them to admit I was the better scientist. But they never did. But you were stopped. The Battle of the Bay. The Battle of the Bay was a ruse, a sham. When you had your daughter, Jack contacted me. We're grandparents now, he said. He asked me what it would take for me to stop to just leave the world alone for a while. I told him I wouldn't stop until the world knew I defeated him. Him, Firefly, a technological champion, the greatest in the world. I told him I wouldn't stop until everyone knew I had won. To my surprise, he agreed. We staged the Battle of the Bay and we both retired. Him to that god-awful farm we tracked you to, me to my palace in Antarctica. That was over a decade ago, and while I may have retired from crime, I could never keep myself from science. She turned to Jill for the first time. You hear that, Jack? I never quit my science. I've been working for years, and I've found the next step in human evolution. She gestured beside her, and for the first time, Jill noticed a strange table. No... Looking closer, it wasn't a table. It was a dense twist of roots that grew into the very floor. And from the top grew the most beautiful flower that Jill had ever seen. Each petal was wide and silky, beautifully spread like an angular rose. It was black, but blushed to a deep brick red in the center. It almost seemed to glow. This island is my crowning achievement. I grew it from a seed, you know. It took years of careful cultivation, of splicing and hacking and searching the darkest parts of the world for the necessary genetic material. I took it and grew it in a forgotten inlet for years until it was ready for the sea. Here, in the ocean, my baby, my new baby, thrived. And finally, after a decade of work, it flowered. She reached out and brushed the dark rose gently, eyes full of love. A flower? Why? Jill's mom asked, tears streaming down her cheeks. This flower, unique in all the world, produces a spore that, when inhaled in a large dose, will cause a miraculous mutation. The brick, thought Jill. It isn't foolproof, unfortunately. Two-thirds of the population will fail. They'll simply choke or mutate improperly. You met some of those, didn't you, Jack? It's tragic, but progress never comes without a cost. They'll call me a monster, but only for today. The future will see me for what I am. A savior. The world has been stumbling forward, evolution crippled by technology, but no more. Today we leap forward. Today we are the lightning striking the primordial ooze. Today we bring the future to Giga City. You can't. Scarlet King's face twitched in anger. I can. I can. In moments, my servants will fly a bomb containing the spore to Giga City. When it explodes high in the air, the concentrated spore will be dispersed, blanketing the city. Oh no, thought Jill. I have to stop it. She struggled but couldn't rise from the chair. What about us? Anne asked. I can't let us be left behind. We'll have to be exposed, too. Once the bomb is away, we'll see how it goes. The resulting mutation should give us enough data to make the process more safe for ourselves. No, said Anne. Please don't. Not me, not Giga City. Thousands will die. Millions, Anne. Millions, Scarlet King said, walking up and kneeling down next to her. She took her daughter's face in her red, gauntleted hands. But don't you worry. She patted her Anne on the cheek. The strong will survive. Then, Scarlet King rose and turned to Jill. And now, Jack, let's get you out of that mask. 
It's almost time for the main event, and I want to see your face. She reached out an armored hand, grabbing the Firefly faceplate. Jill racked her brain, searching for something to say, something clever and strong and quick. The Scarlet King pulled the faceplate free. Uh, hey, Nana, Jill said. The Scarlet King screamed. To be continued. Thanks for listening. 